Hello everyone, uh, welcome to this panel session. I hope you had a good refreshment break. My name is Catherine Shee, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Insurance Insider. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today and I have to congratulate the MGAA on a fantastic turnout for this conference. I don't know about you, but this is the first in-person conference that I've been to and definitely the first in-person panel that I've hosted since lockdown. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, it kind of feels quite normal to see everyone together um, and actually today we're discussing what is the new normal because we all know that the pandemic has changed things maybe for good. Uh, so we're here to discuss what those things are today specifically for the MGA sector. Now I've got a wonderful panel of speakers today who I will actually let introduce themselves first. So Sharon. Hi, Sharon Brown and I'm from Harbour Underwriting. Uh, we're the leading provider in the UK of AT after the event insurance. Uh, morning everyone, Paul Dooley from Grey's American. I'm the European Marketing and Communications Officer and UK Commercial Director. I'm Andre Symes, co-CEO of Genesis Technologies and we supply technology to the insurance sector. Thank you. So we do have just up until half past 12. The panellists have very kindly agreed to take questions, so please do submit them via the app and we'll get through as many as possible. I'm going to try and bring them in through the discussion, so don't wait until the end. Get your thinking caps on now uh, and we'll try and get through as many as possible. So let's start. So I thought we'd do this trading conditions first and on to operations. So if we talk about the trading conditions in the MGA market, Paul, perhaps you can kick us off. How do you think the pandemic has altered trading conditions in the MGA world? Um, I think it's fair to say that um, in, in a number of insurers have uh, changed their uh, attitude towards provision of capacity. Um, many have been kind of busy fixing legacy issues. And I know that's created a, a number of challenges for MGAs that, that I've spoken to during the course of the last 18 months or so. Um, that said, uh, there, are, there are insurers uh, who are free of such legacy issues uh, and there is capacity out there and I think it's a lot to do with how the MGA represents the story, uh, but, but also before that getting an opportunity. Uh, and I know that's been a real challenge uh, for some partners that we've spoken to. Uh, they just can't get hold of people to talk to. But, Thankfully, we've, we've been in a, in a great position during the last 18 months, pretty much legacy free uh, of issues. But uh, I do understand the challenges that, that exist. But, you know, having spoken to a number of MGAs over the last couple of days, uh, people are getting capacity. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities. Yeah, I think Paul makes a really good point. Uh, the storytelling is something that's been, we, we've not been able to do over the past 18 months. Um, and I think that. I don't want to say underwriters have been hiding because this morning has totally made me U-turn on that. I've had some fantastic conversations. Um, but I do think that the storytelling element is, is massively appropriate. And I think that it is getting hold of those guys in the first instance to actually have those meetings and appointments. It's been hard during the, the, the lockdown. And I think that, you know, we're slowly emerging from that. And I think that, you know, the anxiety of picking up the phone and, and all of those things, I think, have compounded massively over the past few months. And I think it's having that confidence again. But what's really nice is that it's been really normal and natural today. I think that it's been a bit weird not wearing masks. <laughs> I think that's been quite odd. But um, I think that, you know, as an industry who, who is in the commercial litigation market, we do truly think that Brexit, COVID have kind of created this perfect storm. Um, and, you know, the industry needs to be looking or the, the, you know, the capacity providers need to be looking not just at vanilla, but at the chocolate chip. And we certainly sit in the chocolate chip area of, uh, of insurance. Um, and, and I think that, you know, it has been hard to have those conversations and to be able to tell the story because there's an energy and enthusiasm around um, capacity provision that isn't told in a two dimensional document. Can I just pick up on the capacity side of things? Because we know the last 18 months to 24 months, there has been a constriction in the amount of delegated authority capacity that's available. What are your indications? Is there any easing of this? Are we seeing people looking perhaps to put some more capacity up against delegated authority risks rather than open market? What's your kind of view, Paul, on how this might play out over the next year? 
I, th I think it's a timing issue mm -hmm. as, as much as just to the previous point there about getting the opportunity to tell the story and sell the, the opportunity to the right people. Um, I think, you know, we're in a hard market. We will start to emerge out of that. And I anticipate as we move through 2022, uh, uh, I think things will start to ease. Um, there's obviously been a lot of internal uh, assessment and realignment and refocus from a number of markets, uh, dealing with issues and problems uh, in books, but that will start to, to ease, I'm sure of it, and things will, will start to return to some level of normality. But in the meantime, uh, opportunities are there. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it is a struggle to get hold of some, some people. I know that that's the case, but, you know, for us, we're having a great, great opportunity of being able to pick our shots in the niche spaces that that we operate, but you know, in, in the main PNC space, uh, I'm sure it's a challenge for, for some MGAs still at the moment. I, th I think it's definitely about being able to stalk underwriters in the Leadenhall market. <laughs> I think that, that's been certainly a change for us, but uh, we will find you. <laughs> We're gonna pick up on that point a bit later. You did talk a bit about telling the story. What do you think is a compelling story for an MGA to tell to an underwriter? Uh, <clears throat> I think it's, you know, the, the MGA is an extension of the insurer, uh, and uh, to, to have some confidence from an insurer's perspective that that MGA has got the insurer's best interests at heart when it comes to delivering profitable underwriting results, because that's what it's about. That is the end result. So if, 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 the, if the data is there and the, uh, the opportunity can be supported with strong data uh, or pointing to, to strong data points, then I think that that is a great starting point because that is a confidence builder uh, and having knowledge about growth expectations, how, how that's going to happen, how that will map out and it, you know, rather than pie in the sky suggestions, it's really about having some, some detail and that gets the confidence because there are so many deals for people to look at, you want your deal to be top of the pile. Anything to add there, Sharon? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think the presentation of, of the information, I think we're going to get onto that a little bit later in terms of data and analysis and, um, and my production. Um, it is paramount, and I think that MGAs need to be really encompassing the, the tech uh, that's available to us now um, and to really look to the future for creating a really good story, a really good structure, very good data, so that it's an obvious choice, I think. You yeah. know, you, you can make a decision really quite quickly because I think one of the biggest things that we found is that, especially in niche and, and specialist areas, is the storytelling can take a long time. Um, and I think that, you know, we want those deals to be done quicker. You know, I, I think that, you know, sometimes these things take a year to get, to get dele delegated to authority, but it's the insurer capacity getting comfortable and oftentimes they don't have the expertise in house, but isn't that the point of an MGA? You know, aren't we providing that expertise at the level that you just can't provide it? And I think that, you know, there is an element of due diligence, but at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're giving that pen to a party that you trust, you know, and, and bringing and, and feeling that you know, we have a fiduciary duty to ensure, you know, you're our lifeblood. What we want to, what we want to have is a long-term relationship. Uh, and I think that, you know, to have stability of management information mm. and all the data that we can gather um, is kind of half the story, but the rest of it is, is actually how are you actually going to provide that? You know, what's your distribution strategy? What's your long-term plan? Um, have you thought about additional products? So I think that, you know, there's a lot to think about when you're providing a presentation to capacity um, yeah. providers. Uh, and, and I think that it would be really helpful, I think, when you first start having those conversations to kind of get an idea, you know, if you want a black car, do you want, um, you know, do you want four alloys on it? Do you want to have power steering? You know, yeah. tell us kind of upfront what you need, what you want. Let's not get to commercial decisions at the 11th hour and to turn around and say, well, we've not got a license for it. Mm. Crikey. <laughs> you know, and, and that does happen. You know, we're not alone in that, that you do all of the work and we prepare all of the papers and then we get to the 11th hour and, and well, actually, we don't have a license for legal expenses. Like, <laughs> crikey. <laughs> Mm. Okay, so we'll come on to the data and analytics part in a bit, and that's when I'm going to bring in Andre right over there. Um, 
you talked a little bit, Sharon, about trying to find people and having accessibility to people. The pandemic and remote working must have exacerbated that. I and mean, how many brokers have kind of come, I know to, on the insider team, lots of brokers have said it's so much easier for an underwriter to say no on an email or on a Zoom mm. screen or something like that. Has that been a similar challenge for MGAs during during lockdown? I think I think it has, but I think similarly for brokers, I think that what what has ended up happening is that a broker will send an email out to 50 parties and they'll expect a quote. And so they're asking everyone to log the inquiry to, you know, to produce some kind of yes or no answer. Um, back in the day, 18 months ago, we were, you know, brokers were selective about who they approached. And I think that, you know, it, we've got to be sensitive to that as well. When we're seeking capacity, we've got to be, you know, there are emerging markets coming through. And I think that, you know, we need to, we, we need to, it goes back to storytelling again, I think. Mm -hmm. Paul? Yeah, I, th I think, um, <clears throat> ironically, the, the, the pandemic created a, a phenomenal opportunity for us from an availability perspective because mm. no one was traveling. So quite frankly, there, there were a lot of very accessible people. Um, and I think it depends how you, as an insurer, set up your distribution. Um, you know, if you've got a control distribution and you're able to deliver that compelling, outstanding service and get back to people. Um, and this is the biggest issue, I think, during the pandemic, uh, as I've touched on already, is accessibility. Um, and I know for some, some people, uh, it's improved massively during the pandemic because there has been no traveling. I would be traveling three or four days a week mm. normally, and I haven't been. So I've been able to do lots of, lots of stuff that I otherwise wouldn't. And you kind of create a sense of expectation then, I suppose, that people want to get hold of you and they know you'll be sat there in front of your, mm. your PC. But now the world is spinning again and we're traveling, this is great. Uh, and it's absolutely fabulous to, to be at the first in-person conference again today. We're a people business, and that's, you know, I would absolutely passionately state that. It's great to meet people and do business in person, and there's something quite different about that. Mm. But the pandemic and doing remote uh, Zoom calls or Teams calls or whatever has been efficient, and there's been a degree of efficiency that has saved the multiple trips uh, up and down the country, and you've been able to drive opportunities through a lot quicker. We certainly have during the course of the last 18 months. So there are some upsides to it, and there are some downsides to it, I think, in the, the earlier point about people hiding. Uh, it is a lot easier to hide. <coughs> okay, so let's, let's move on to this data and tech piece, particularly the analytics. This is where, Andre, you come in. Um, so, you know, what opportunities, Andre, are there out there for MGAs on the data and tech side that could help them tell that story, you know, even better to paper providers? Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. And <clears throat> one of the things that we've seen quite a bit in the MGA space is that if you can actually take a fully working model to the carrier before or the, or the capacity provider before you actually ask for that, it just strengthens the proposition that Sharon was talking about. Um, and the big shift that has happened regarding data in the last few years is that data accessibility used to be relatively expensive. Integrating platforms from a carrier to an MGA was really, really expensive. You had to get in middleware, et cetera. And as the tech has changed, we now have access to APIs, webhooks, et cetera. There's now a plethora of data providers. You can walk outside to the exhibition center, you'll meet 30 of them that are there ready to give you the information and you can switch it on overnight. And that just gives any MGA an option of, you know, where do I want my data? Do I want to look at cyber risk analysis? Do I want to get telematics input? What kind of IoT devices, you know, commercial space do I want to have a look at? And these things were very expensive many years back, but now everybody has access to it. So you can really piece together a very, very valuable proposition by just plugging in little bits where, where you need to in, in, in the, the little ecosystem, which I know is a bit of a buzzword. <laughs> but just, just back to the point about you know, the, the, the in-person thing, I, I agree that we, we can have a way more efficient conversation with, with, with capacity providers and MGAs in Zoom, but the quality of conversation is just so much better when it's in person, right? And I see that with our design team as well, that just an in-person conversation it's, it's 10x more valuable than, than a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. um, Paul or Sharon, any sort of data or tech opportunity do you think could be definitely exploited on the MGA side? I think we've, we've recently invested in a, in a program, an underwriting program, and it's a, it's a <coughs> cradle to, you know, to cradle to grave inquiry through to policy and then the, the life cycle of the policy. Um, and this has given us 
a greater element of control um, in the inquiries that we receive. Um, just going back to the point about you know just blasting our emails to a whole load of um, to a whole load of insurers, I think that can happen and it can skew that lead to quote quote to sale uh, conversion rate piece. So I think that you know having those having that information having that data then allows you to go back to individual brokers or intermediaries and say actually the reason we've got so many no quotes or no uh, you know we, we don't want to look, look at the inquiry um, gives us the opportunity to build relationships and be very precise about our underwriting criteria so I think the, the multitudes of opportunities for utilization of data are huge always it's crap in crap out so you've got to be very very careful about what you put into these systems and i think that 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 goes into you know the education programs um right at the start and i think you know what covid has produced an opportunity for is new starters in organizations we actually probably get into the system side of things a little bit quicker and because those are the easy things to learn online um, but latterly, we've found that, yeah, once you've done all of that process stuff, you then need to start integrating them into the business and, and really developing them as people. But we'll probably go on to that. Yeah. Paul, is there any, if I flip this question on its head, you know, can you identify any opportunities in the MGA space for all the tech providers out there? You know, they want to know how can we work with MGAs better? Is there anything where, you know, that isn't being done at the moment or the partnerships aren't being formed, which would be really beneficial? Um, well, I think, you know, from, from an MGA's perspective, it's about delivering quality service to its partners and being able to represent risks and uh, data to their insurer partners. Um, so the speed at which that happens uh, is, is crucial in terms of delivering service excellence. Um, so we delivered a, um, a quote and bind platform, and just as a typical example, um, it puts the power in the MGA's hand or in the broker's hand. They have control of when they run the quotes, when they bind the business. So you're not reliant upon reaching out to an underwriter. So if you have that control in your hand, uh, Andre's touched on ecosystems. There are a number of full cycle ecosystems that I'm aware of that are very, very good. Um, you know, you can report claims 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, fantastic. You know, you're not reliant upon somebody picking up a phone or Answering a, call, answering a call or an email. Um, so having, uh, being alive to, to the digital platforms that are there that will introduce improved efficiencies, I think that is the new norm and that is the future. Uh, there's countless articles in the press on a daily basis uh, about digitalization, but it, jumping on that and being able to capitalize on the efficiencies that brings is, I think, essential. Uh, in the way forward. We still need to speak to each other. We still need to have dialogue about specific opportunities. But once that deal's in place, having the free flow uh, of the ability to be able to quote and buy a business or report a, a claim, I think that's, that's essential. I think also, um, just, just in terms of the experience that, that we've had, when we were procuring um, the service provider for the underwriting system, I think that tech provision has been really slow to provide really good MGA systems. Um, you know, forgive me if I'm wrong, and there's, there's service providers in here that have been doing it the whole way, but I think what's happened is the utilization of a broker system has then kind of been, can I say, bastardized into an MGA system. And so we're kind of bending, you know, the provision of a, of a broker system into an MGA system. And we're kind of thinking, well, well, it doesn't make sense in our environment. You're having to rename things. You're having to, you know, go out for, to quote for, to insure it. Well, well, actually, it's an internal provision. And, and it's a it's kind of an odd way to do things. I think it would be really good to see a tech provider start from the beginning with an MGA as opposed to trying to utilise mm. systems that already exist and say, well, actually, we can, we can move this, we can bend this, the IBA systems will work in this. I think there's, there's still opportunities for tech providers to be very focused on MGAs. Whether there's the financial return um, mm. in providing those kind of systems, I don't know. Look, that's, that's a really, really good point. Um, and as we heard this morning about the MGA sector and how quickly it's growing, you can see the tech space reacting to that. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, you can actually even follow the investment capital that's coming into the, in the insure tech space to service this market. It's, it's really moving into the B2B space. The challenge that any new startup or Neopass provider has is 
the complexity of insurance. So you have the challenge that yes, you can build something now ground up to service the MGA market in the way that you want, but does it understand insurance and the complexities behind that? Mm -hmm. So the traditional broker systems or insurer systems that might be very monolithic and heavy, at least they understand all the various iterations of how policy could be handled, all the various different MTAs and terms. And these things just take time to build out. Mm -hmm. So whilst we see the, 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 the new businesses propping up, and it's great to see that it means that the market is healthy, it's going to take them some time to be able to be comprehensive. Uh, so I think it's a game of, you know, for the time being, we're probably going to have to have compromise somewhere mm -hmm. um, until such time as the people can catch up with that. But it's a very, very valid point is that systems are often bastardized and, and plugged into, into the holes that they shouldn't be. Yeah. And then that creates inefficiencies. And not just that, it just creates a bad taste about IT projects. Uh, yeah, it, there were frustrations surrounding it. And I think there's, you know, we invest a lot of money in these projects. And, and they end up, you know, the sales pitch to begin with is very much, yes, we can do it, we, we can satisfy all of those things. But as you say, the complexities, and the complexities range from each um, different product. You know, there's some have renewal, some don't. And, and I think that, you know, you would need to sit down, as you say, and create a bespoke system, um, and that can take years. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and then you look at all the legacy systems, that the, all of the mergers and acquisitions that are going on in the market at the moment. I mean, we all remember Norwich Union and, and all of the, the different parties that ended up as, as Aviva and all the legacy systems that they were left with. You know, it was a very siloed organisation at, at some points. Uh, and I think that, you know, there is a lot that we can do, you know, the APIs, there are connections between different systems and the information that you can pick up. And at the end of the day, the data that you input is available to report on. Yeah. And I think that, you know, wherever it comes from, it, it's, it's such a great source of future kind of planning. I've actually got a question here on technology so from the audience, so I think it's a good time to bring it in. So uh, this person says, uh, technology has a vital role to play in achieving seamless business transactions between MGAs and other stakeholders. Do you think MGAs are generally open to embracing technology, or do you have any input around achieving improvements in this area? Uh, Andre, I'll come to you first. Um, so I think the short answer about MGAs embracing it is absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority of the customers that we deal with at the moment are MGAs, uh, particularly in the GI space, um, and they're very much open to embracing tech. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, you know, last night I was having a conversation with a, an MGA who just did a, quite, a, quite a, um, a big bit of business from, from a, they got a big investment from SoftBank. And they simply state that if we don't have access to APIs, we will not do business with you. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's they becoming tech first, you know, um, because they understand that that is going to give them the flexibility, the optionality, the ability to pivot into different products in the future. Um, so it's, it's really bubbled to the top. So absolutely, the MGAs are supporting it. Mm -hmm. And, and I think you want, you know, we're all prospecting. We want our client relationship systems integrated with our underwriting systems so that you can move from prospect through to, to client. To, and I think that, you know, there are all manner of things out there. Salesforce has been around for a long time and, and there's lots of companies that sit on the front of those applications in order to utilise those amazing facilities that, that people like Salesforce bring to the table. Um, I think that, the, the complexity surrounding each, each MDA is, is your challenge. And I think that, you know, we all have different needs and different demands. But I think fundamentally, um, we're all acting on behalf of an insurer and the language just needs to change. You know, it, it just needs to sort of change to match that of an MGA. So. Paul, anything from you before we move on? Uh, yeah, uh, I think generally the people that I've spoken to in the MGA space are receptive. Uh, and I think it's always a condition of cost, isn't it? Um, you know, what's the ROI for this investment and does do the efficiency gains make sense? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a balancing act, but generally there would be a, 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 an openness um, to moving forward to that. I have one more question from the audience before we move on to sort of the remote working piece of this discussion. Um, so this person asks, has the COVID BI test case, coupled with regulatory change such as GI pricing, et cetera, um, made insurers' expectations from MGAs increase around data or MI, et cetera, um, increase so much to a level which is perhaps challenging for MGAs. I don't know who wants to tackle that one. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's a fair question, a uh, very good question, and it's probably more of a statement actually at the moment. Mm. Uh, and I think that has been the landscape uh, in the last 18 months and probably uh, partly due to the conditioning of, of uh, some insurers' reluctance to, to engage with capacity provision. Um, 
and you know a heightened sense of uh, a requirement for increased data um, to give them the security that they want to make the decisions. Um, you know, you, and it's kind of if you look at the the conditions of a hard market, that's that's symptomatic. It's what 18, 20 years since we saw the last hard market, but this is a condition of the hard market. More data, please. Condition of the soft market, spin it on its head. Mm -hmm. You know, less data. Just give me a mm -hmm. uh, give me a little clipping, and I'll put a deal together for you. Um, but certainly in the landscape that we're in right now, uh, it has driven a request, a, a, a demand for more data. Uh, tell me more of a story, otherwise, no thanks. I'm not interested. Do you think those back of fag packet deals will ever return? Do you think? I don't think so. Uh, I think life will get easier when, when we kind of spin back into a softer market and people come out of the, 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 the hard market situation we're in at the moment. Um, I think you have to be really mindful. We all have to be mindful of the regulatory landscape mm -hmm. that, that we sit in and having a, a sharp focus and an understanding of that regulatory landscape and working with a partner that can kind of walk you through that is, is critical. Um, you know, to do things uh, in, in a half-baked way is not the right way, mm -hmm. uh, and it will come back and bite you at some point. Great, so let's um, move on to remote working, and then I'll leave some time at the end for questions for anyone who wants to get in the question before the end. Um, remote working or hybrid work environment, this feels like the new normal. Um, mm -hmm. If this is the case, what does this mean for talent and career progression you know, in the MGA space? I think, I feel like there is some very big questions that need to be answered still. Mm. Um, Sharon, if you can. I think, uh, I mean, I've got so many of my own internal team examples, and one of them sat over there, actually. <laughs> um, so we brought Ellie in, and she came straight from law school. Um, and it was fine to begin with, because as I said, we were going through all the systems and the processes, and then all of a sudden it kind of flattened. And then it was that, you know, the, I think it's osmosis, maybe the word, where right. you kind of, you know, the information around you kind of absorbs, because people are talking around you. When they say you're learning French, go to France, absorb, you know, get into the, get into going to the cafes and and talk it. And I just think that 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 has gone, you know. And and I think that that's so important because it's the conversations that you hear your underwriters having on the phone that enable your younger colleagues. And, and you know, I'm learning. I've only been in the uh, the, the kind of this law um, part of the industry for two years. And without all of these conversations, it's been difficult to, to get that learning in. Um, so I think that there's definitely going to be a transition now. I mean, Ellie came into the office last week and said, Jaron, I've learned more in, the, in this day than having six months. I'm not particularly impressed with that. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, she's, you know, and, and it's a great position to be in. And now we're kind of saying hybrid working works. My journey into the office is from outside of Ipswich. It takes me two and a half hours just to get into the office. Now, that's not productive time. I've not always got access to Wi-Fi. So I've now saved five hours a day. OK, I do a little bit of uh, horse riding in the meantime. But um, I do make the most of that, that time. Um, now, we decided that we're not going to come back into the office wholeheartedly. Um, the jobs that we do don't really require that. However, the networking piece, we are going to come in one or two days a week because this is invaluable. You know, there is nothing that can replace this. Um, I think what, you know, we've learned from all of this is collaboration, adaptation has been key um, to, to bringing this business together. Over the last 18 months, I mean, we've grown exponentially and there's there are, you know, there are MGAs who felt who've done exactly the same thing. We've been able to concentrate our efforts efforts on distribution. We've been able to be accessible, as you were saying, to to brokers, um, and and it's worked really, really well for us. Um, I think that what I feel from this situation is a good analogy would be you're driving along the M6, and there's an accident in front of you. There's lots of rubbernecking going on, and there's there's some casualties and. For the next 10 miles, you slow down. You're at 70 miles an hour. You look in your wing mirror. You're kind of conscious. You, you've probably got some white knuckles going on. And then before you know it, you're back at 90 miles an hour again. You've forgotten about the accident. And I think that's something that we've got to take away from this, is we've learned a lot. Uh, we've learned about teamwork. We've learned about empathy, you know, because we don't know how we should know, but how our colleagues have suffered through this. Have they lost people? You know, and there's, there's a whole load of things that I think that we need to make sure that we don't forget. 
Um, and I think recounting that is really important. And it's, you know, the lessons that we're learning. Um, I think, you know, let's not forget it. Mm -hmm. Andre. Mm. No, look, I agree 100% with the, the notion that you, you learn via osmosis. So we recently, I think I announced it yesterday on, on social media, implemented our hybrid policy. And uh, we, we're going to do a two days a week in the office. Obviously, we don't have to network uh, at, at Lloyd's or in, in Lime Street. But a lot of the best innovative ideas that we have come up with have come up over a, a ping pong game or you know, a beer in the afternoon on a Friday, water coolers. People tend to have great ideas by accident. And that's kind of where a lot of the innovation comes from. So if you put people in the room together, the right people, they'll come up with the same idea. The challenge with Zoom is that you have to have an intentional conversation. You have to go, we're going to talk about something, and then the magic doesn't necessarily happen. I know that that might sound a little bit uh, fluffy, but it genuinely makes a difference when coming up with new ideas, when you're trying to be innovative in the tech space. Um, there's, we cannot ignore the efficiencies that, that, have, that we have seen with working from home. So as an example, when we had to make the switch to go permanently or immediately go work from home March last year, Immediately, we saw a 27% jump in efficiency in the existing uh, uh, team members that we had. So you couldn't ignore that. The people got used to being able to see their kids in the morning, take their kids to soccer practice or football practice, sorry, in the afternoons. And you don't want to lose that element because everybody, uh, we are all humans. I had a conversation with uh, a C-level at a large uh, insurer um, and mid-conversation, his kid came running through the room and jumped on his lap and it changed the tone of the meeting. Uh, this was via Zoom, mid-pandemic. Um, and I think it's equalized it, and everybody's learned a bit of empathy. We've all had to do homeschooling. We've all had to cancel a meeting somewhere. So you need the element of flexibility. So you have to get the people together to have the magic, to have the creativity. But then you also still need to keep that efficiencies going. Mm -hmm. And never mind that, having a flexible working environment does cast your talent pool a little bit wider. You mm -hmm. can attract better talent. Um, and We've just gone through a recruitment exercise now, and I've got about 700 applicants for the various jobs we put out. And I would say about 80% of them were insistent on having a hybrid model. That is just what they expect. This is just what the, the new generation wants. Yeah. Paul, very quickly, and then we'll move on to some questions. Yeah, but I won't repeat everything that's been said. I think there are, there are uh, upsides and downsides to it. The upsides to it, uh, the, the mental health, the, the kind of you know, home, uh, home work-life balance, the ability to spend that time with families, uh, downsides to it I'm guessing you know some people have really struggled um, you know with remote working and something that as an employer we ought to be really conscious of um, but probably there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution here I think as a business you need to make the call on what's right for your business but a hybrid policy seems to be the way forward mm -hmm. great so we've got some questions and I've got one final question for you all um, now this person asked does the panel feel that IT providers are close enough to insurers' data requirements in assisting MGAs who predominantly their customers. So I think the, the question is, uh, does the panel feel that IT providers are close enough to understanding what the data requirements on the part of the, of the insurers are when MGAs are a part of this um, transaction? Andre, I don't know. Mm, that's <laughs> Sorry. <a>, no, that's, <laughs> again, a, actually a tough question. And I think the short answer is no. Um, you know, there can always be work be done there um, to improve that data quality, to improve the data arriving at the carrier and, and, and better understanding. Because as you say, a lot of the IT providers will be coming from a different space, wouldn't fully understand exactly what the MGAs need, and then there would be gaps to close in that. So the, the answer is there's always work to be done there. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that the experience that I've had, the analysts have been really good. Um, and I think it's the quality of the people that you bring into the business to analyse what it is. Cause, even if they have no clue about the business, all of a sudden this person within two months knows your business inside out. And I think it is, it's about quality of employment. And, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, what has been the one largest challenge and one most positive significant win for MGAs during the last 18 months? Paul. Hmm. <laughs> Putting you right on the spot here. <laughs> yeah. Um, la largest challenge, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the uh, accessibility of insurer partners that that must be the biggest challenge for MGAs um, because without that things can't cycle forward um, the mm, the biggest success um, may, maybe saving a ton of cash from not having to travel around the country <laughs> expense management Despair, yeah yeah <laughs> 
I was just about to say that I've just done a re-forecast for our cost towards the end of the year and, and you know, we've made significant savings. However, I'm going to spend it all next year. <laughs> Andre, any, any position from where you're standing doesn't necessarily have to be about MGAs, but for your business? I th it's, it's, it's more of, of, I think, a medium-term win, is that it's, it's changed the perception about how the, the, the ability to be agile when it comes to your business. Um, Pre-pandemic, everybody was just kind of doing what they were doing. And, and yes, we were talking about how do we pivot to new products as, as MGAs progress. But if a lot of them were forced to, and that just elevated the idea, and now they're hyper aware that we have to be able to innovate and change if the next pandemic happens. So it's just that mindset, mindset shift that I think has been a great win for, for the execs. Great. Now, I've got one last question for the three of you. Um, rapid fire, we've got one minute left. Um, so now we've emerged into the new normal, what do you think has changed for good? Attitudes. Okay. Um, I, think, I think attitudinally, uh, um, the whole kind of remote working and working from home thing, uh, there's been a massive sea change of acceptance uh, and understanding that there are advantages to be drawn from that. Mm -hmm. I think I think employer empathy, I'm not suggesting that all employers empathise, but I think employer empathy is, is a really big one for me. It's certainly something that we've learned as an organisation is, you know, you touched on the point before that each, each every person is individual and some people have found this very, very tough. Um, and the re-emergence back into society, you know, can be a very, it, you know, it's an, an anxious time um, for a lot of people. Andre. Yeah, I was going to do the empathy one. That's a, that's a great point. But I suppose the one thing that it also has changed for good, I think, is um, the acknowledgement that if we need to change, we can, and that we actually have a legacy thinking issue rather than a legacy problem or legacy technology problem issue. Nice. Well, that is where we have to... We're out of time completely, and I think we've got lunch now, so I'm sure everyone's starving. <laughs> um, please give a massive round of applause to our panellists. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. And yes, well... I hope you enjoyed that discussion. Thank you so much for your questions and enjoy the rest of the conference.